Okay, in terms of the stuff, it's always just bad news. But on the plus side, less bad news. Deadlines remain, well actually, well, actually about the same amount. The uh, deadlines remain the same as they've been all along. Exam 3, which covers uh, part 3, our good dead friends, you know, John Locke and Bishop Barkley. Exam 4, which covers the stuff we're talking about now, our good dead friend David Hume and Emmanuel Kant. Uh, and the quizzes for part 4, which covers these two dead guys. Deadlines, uh, Friday, April 24th, end of day, which is 11 to 9, 59 p.m. Exam number 5, which covers all the stuff. Deadlines on Thursday, April 30th at noon. You can always do stuff you know, ahead of time before the deadline, but just be sure to get it completed before the deadline. For the paper, um, Tuesday was a deadline for the plus five bonus, but there's still the full credit bonus, uh, full credit deadline, which is April 21st. And as long as you upload the paper to Blackboard by end of day on April 21st, which is 11.59.59 p.m., you'll get the full credit for the paper. There's also the half credit deadline, which uh, deadlines on April 24th, and as long as the paper, the paper isn't after the 21st, but by end of day on April 24th, it'd be half. So the best deadline is passed, and now we're on the full credit deadline. Before pressing on to the new stuff, finishing up David Hume, heading to our good dead friend Emmanuel Kant, anything about any stuff to be, or stuff that is bad and that needs more stuff. Also, for again, again, the way the grade breakdown goes, same as it's always been, for the quizzes, best 10 out of the whole bunch for 30%, for the exams, best 4 out of 5, and they're 40%, and for the paper, it's best paper out of the paper, and that's 30%. To see where you are in the class right now in terms of your sort of real-time grade, just buy a browser, go to Blackboard, look at your overall grade column, and they'll give you your grade if you just stop doing stuff. And it's already, Blackboard's already doing all the stuff that it needs to do. Specifically, anything you haven't done, it treats as a hypothetical zero. If you do something, it swaps out the zero for wherever your real grade is. So right now, for example, suppose you haven't done exam three, exam four, or exam five, though it's, those are treated as zeros, and so your, your overall grade would probably look pretty, pretty bad. So if you haven't done the paper yet, then that would be put in a zero, and so your grade would look pretty bad as well. It's also doing all the adding, and all the keeping or dropping, however you look at it, automatically. So I don't have to go in and like change any stuff. Blackboard does that in real time. So as soon as you do something, your overall grade will, will update. Sorry, where have I been this one time? So we turned the paper in through Blackboard, not yes. physically. So. Right, because okay. that way it gives you it gives you like an extra, um, you know, seven, well, yeah, about an extra we seven hours. We already did it. Like yeah, because I did Blackboard. It's our grade, right? Yeah, you already, already turned it in. Yeah, the grades there, that, that's okay. your grade. Yep. And then um, as far as the um, exams, um, so we can take all five of them and you'll pick the, four, the best three four. four. Yeah, uh, Blackboard picks the best four to five. And so what it, it, it doesn't, I don't have to do anything. Blackboard just, whatever your lowest exam score is, it drops that. Okay. So if you, for so example. So it won't hurt you to take them all then. Right, yeah, because doing more stuff can never lower your grade because right now, Anything you haven't done is treated as a zero, a zero and you can't get lower than, than a zero. So it always either, worst case, it leaves your grade the same because it's not better than, than the other stuff, or the, you know, the best case, it actually improves it. And the thing to do is look, like I said, the grade that it's giving you right now is your worst possible grade in the sense that everything is treated as a zero you haven't done, and it's already you know, dropping and keeping stuff where you look at it. And doing more stuff will either leave it the same if you do worse, or improve it if you do better. But in mind, since we only have, you know, we don't have pluses and minuses at FAMU, it improving it may not be enough to bump it up to the next next grade. And so you can decide whether to take the final or not, because the final essentially is a ten, you know, the four tests cover everything. The final is essentially attended as an extra chance. Okay. So if you're if you get like a bad exam grade, you need an extra one. The final is there for that, so it can swap out. A bad test score. But if you get four of the test scores and you're like, hey, I don't feel like taking the final, then you keep your best, your best four and drop the final. What is the final um, schedule? Oh, you can do it anytime you want. It's on Blackboard. But the deadline for it is be sure to finish it by Thursday, April 30th. At, at the, yep. And I use the, to be you know, fully fair, 
I use the end of the normal in-class final time for that, just so you get a full, a full amount of time you, you would if, get if you had to take a the exam you know, in the desk. Thanks. Is the person that posted online, is that supposed to be that grade plus five, or is it the five already added? Well, if you did, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you did the yeah, because if you did the paper for the plus five deadline, the what it'll probably show like in the comment section, base grade, you know, plus five, and so the five's already already in there. Yeah. Okay. Anything else? Okay. So on to finish off our good friend Dave. So this time we're looking at uh, Dave's theory of religion, and we saw essentially that kind of the a key point for him is he says there are essentially two ways, you know, to get to truthy stuff. One is by truths, you know, of reason, as Leibniz would say, or as he calls, you know, relations of ideas. And though, although those truths are absolutely necessarily true, they don't tell us anything about what exists. So Hume, because he thinks that a priori reasoning never tells you what exists, he rejects all those a priori arguments for God. So the ontological argument of God's perfect, he's got to exist, because he didn't, he wouldn't be perfect, but he is, so he does. He says, no, nah, that's, that's out. So the only possible option would be, you know, dealing with truths of fact, matters of fact. And he says that those don't work either. But he ends up not being an atheist, as we'll see, because he doesn't claim that he definitely knows that God doesn't exist. He claims he definitely doesn't know that God does exist, and so essentially is a skeptic or seemingly agnostic. Now, turning now to his five problems about God's existence. Now, as I mentioned, he was essentially skeptical about religion. And his work on philosophy of religion is as aptly named Dialogues Concerning Natural Religion. And as I mentioned last time, it involves three main characters. Calanthes, who is a believer, who relies on um, a posteriori arguments for God. Basically arguments based in empirical reasoning. You know, a posteriori after experience. The second character, Demia, is using, he's a believer too, but he relies on faith and also a priori, pure reason arguments. And the third character is Philo, who is essentially Hume's, you know, character. And the way you can always tell in a dialogue who, which character is the author's character, it's the person who comes across the best and wins, unless the author is kind of weird. So how does he go through and look at five arguments, or five problems for arguing for God's existence? Well, here's how it makes that happen. Problem one. Well, what he's essentially saying and going after is something we saw, you know, in our good friend, dead friend Descartes. Descartes reasoned that, well, if you got an effect, you can sort of infer from that effect a couple things. One critical assumption by Descartes is whatever brought about that effect has to be at least as real as that effect. You know, which in a way makes sense. You can't get something from nothing. And I use a crappy example of a cell phone battery. If you know your battery is charged in your cell phone like this much, you know whatever charged it had at least that much juice. Or speaking of juice, if you have a glass of juice, or orange juice that's this full, you know the container had at least that much juice in it, which seems true. Secondly, there's also the assumption that the effect must resemble the cause, which is somewhat more more debatable, especially since resemblance is pretty vague. And so the reasoning that he's going after is basically like this. We get a universe. And we infer from the effect, the universe, there must be a cause that is at least is you know, real as the universe and resembles the universe. And the usual reasoning, of course, is you know, you know universe is really awesome, it's really big, etc. There must be a, something that caused it. This creator is God, so God exist. And Hume says there are basically five problems with this argument. Problem one. God is supposed to be infinite. But Hume says, perhaps incorrectly, 
that to infer a infinite cause from a finite effect would be mistaken reasoning. Even if we assume, you know, that whatever amount of, you know, awesomeness the effect has got to have, that the, well, the effect has, the cause has to have that, if we have a finite universe, that does not entail a infinite God, or infinite anything. Because you can get the finite from the finite, so getting the finite from the infinite, infinite as an inference would be flawed. Now, one obvious concern about his argument is this. Is the universe actually finite? No. Maybe not. <laughs> yeah, we don't know. I mean, we, we could tell if it was finite, you know, it's kind of like a room. How do you, you know, imagine you're like in a darkened room. How do you know if, if the room is like a certain size? Well, you wander in the dark, it's touching, all, you know, touching the walls. And if you touch all the walls, you're like, well, I'm in a room this big. But if you're just walking and walking, as long as you're walking, you know, you know the room, you can't touch anything, you know the room, either you're walking in circles, or the room is bigger than, than that. So, yeah. yeah, and so when we can tell if the universe in a way is finite, because we hit like, a, like the edge of the universe. And if we can recognize it, say, yep, you, know, you see a sign, edge of the universe, <laughs> you know, then we know we were, were there. But, and you really never know if it was infinite, because you just kept going and going. You could always say, you know, it's like, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Type of deal. And you wouldn't, yeah, you never know. So we can only kind of go theoretically with that. You know, we could do some, some kind of like theoretical, you know, uh, reasoning in, in cosmology that we have an infinite universe. So one response to Hume might be, well, the universe really is infinite. So we need an infinite cause. So God's okay. Or we might argue that even if the universe is not infinite, it's still really, 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 really big. And not everyone needs to believe that God is infinite. You might just say, well, God is like, you know, super incredible but not infinite, and that would be good enough. It all depends, again, on how, what God's qualities have to, to be. Second problem, the imperfect universe. Now, as Hume sees it, the problem that's occurring is this. It's that even if we grant that whatever, you know, awesomeness there is in the effect, it's got to be in the cause. Well, if we look at the universe, is the universe perfect? Do you have some complaints to the management about how reality is well? For the most part, it is. It's perfect for us. Well, it isn't really perfect. Would you, would you, is there anything you'd change? Would you get rid of, like, Ebola? <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, no. yeah, it's perfect. yeah, you'd probably get rid of Ebola. You know, this problem, you'd probably get rid of, like, you know, maybe hurricanes, you know, Leeches, mosquitoes, herpes, you know, AIDS, <laughs> cancer. Yeah, it's probably a lot of things, you know, we, we probably... How would you be able to torture people with that? What? How could you torture people? Well, you want to get rid of that, too. I mean, you, like, you want to get that torture out of there. Doing stuff like Ebola or like HIV or something like that, that's population control. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's, <laughs> you could see it as population control, or you just have, you know, you could just have like a little button you push, you know, to <laughs> get stuff off. Could be working, you know, could imagine, you know, Kind of can be like on your phone, you have a preference thing. You just go to your preferences, scroll down, you know, reproduce, turn that off for a while. <laughs> and you want to kids, turn that back on. That'd be pretty handy. Wow. Yeah, so we could say, we might say, well, the universe is imperfect, so we can't infer a perfect cause. I mean, to use a, a crappy analogy, imagine you go, you go and take a class, and someone walks in and says, I'm the perfect, they spend the whole time telling you, like, what a perfect student they are. Like, I'm a perfect student, perfect student. And you're like, oh, God. And then he like test day comes around, you look over and you see like Mr. or Mrs. Perfect has gotten like a 70 on the exam. Would you still believe they were a perfect student? No. No, because no, perfect students would get 100 on everything. Unless the class was like you know, really unfair. And so Hume says basically, you know, the universe is imperfect, so we cannot infer a perfect cause. Just like with a student. If you have a student who's getting like C's, they're like, you wouldn't infer that they were a perfect student. Now, but suppose, hypothetically, as Leibniz claimed, we assume the universe is as good as it could be. Would that entail then that the creator would be, you know, perfect? Well, Hume basically says, in mean, kind of a connection to the imperfect one, is that we don't know how long God has been practicing. 
you know, to use you know another crappy analogy, if you looked at the works by say, you know, Rembrandt or Michelangelo, would you infer that he always was great? Even when he was like three months old and he's cranking out masterpieces. No. no. And so what he's saying is, well, maybe, you know, God's not like really perfect, because even if we assume the universe is really awesome, it'd be like looking at the final works of Michelangelo or, you know, any artist and saying, well, look how good that is. They were, they were always this great. Now, you still, of course, could infer, well, using that reason, you'd say, well, God is at least as good as the universe. But again, he's going after kind of the God of philosophers. God's going to be perfect. And it's a fair question to you know, ask, what do we mean by perfect? And is that actually the God that people really believe in? Do they believe in the you know, all-knowing, all-good, and all-powerful? Fourth problem, multiple gods. Now take, uh, like Tucker Hall, this building. Now we infer that, of course, this, this effect, this building, was caused by something. We, we infer that it just didn't... You know, appear one day, and we, you know, our belief is, of course, since we've seen buildings being built, that people built it. But do we think that, like one guy, say Bob, built the building all by himself? Bob just shows up, with his lunch bucket, and hammer, and builds Tucker Hall. No, no. We, with it was such a big project, we would think it was lots of people working on it. Unless so he was Bob the builder. Unless he was Bob the builder, exactly. But he would totally, he would make that happen. Because he is that awesome with his magic hammer. And he gets the girl at the end. He's kind of, kind of surprised. Those tools are animated. Yeah, that, that's handy. You get animated tools. You know, a computer game. Much better than the standard hammer. So when you have like a, something like a building or anything big, we generally infer lots of people built it. So he would say you had a big universe. Maybe there's not just one god, but a whole bunch of gods built it. And of course, that was you know classic pantheism. People who are, um, or sorry, classic uh, paganism, polytheism. Yeah. Pantheism is there's just everything's gone. Polytheism is you get a lot of gods. And that was kind of the old school view. You get Zeus, you know, Poseidon, and Hades, or Ra, you know, Isis, not the terrorist group, the <laughs> goddess, Osiris, um, etc. And so Hume says, well, you got a big universe. You would think that something built it. This could be like a whole bunch of gods. We could be in polytheism. Back to paganism. Last problem, he infers that if we get a physical universe, the constructor would be a, you know, if we infer a physical cause, you know, if we, if we have a physical effect, we infer a physical cause, and so we end up with a material God in a material world. And again, Hume considers that to be a problem, because God is supposed to be infinite, perfect, and non-material. Now, the gist of his argument basically is this. Even if, even if we infer the cause from the effect, basically we have this effect, what, what caused it, we are not justified in inferring a perfect, infinite, single, non-physical being. Because there's nothing about our effect that guarantees that that is true. I mean, he says, honestly, it could be true, but there's no certainty in that. This could, could all be mistaken. Again, because his position is never, you know, definitive atheism. He doesn't say, you know, therefore God doesn't exist. He just says, you know, we don't know. Which is always a safe position, especially when we don't, don't know. So he ends up being essentially an agnostic. Now, in his own case, he was raised by Calvinists. Not like Calvin and Hobbes Calvinists, but Calvin, Calvinists. And he ended up giving up religion pretty early on. Now, interesting, a little bit of an anecdote. As he was um, you know, dying, he was visited by James Boswell, the famous uh, biographer of Samuel Johnson, not to be confused with Samuel uh, Jackson. And Boswell asked Hume, do you believe in an afterlife or not? And Hume said, well, it's possible that if you took a piece of coal and threw it on the fire, that it might not burn. But he took the view that it would be an unreasonable fancy that he should live forever. Now, but he does have, because of his view of causation, as we'll see, he does leave open that possibility. How so? Well, 
one reason he's a agnostic, you know, skeptic rather than a definitive atheist or theist is given his view of causation. You know, you've got that habituation. You know, a, B, A, B, A, B. Oh, A must cause B type of scenario. Since we never see the connection, the necessity of the cause, he says all events seem loose and unconnected, that anything could follow from anything. There's one thing that Hume, you know, one of his many contributions was laying out what we call the problem of induction, which is basically with inductive reasoning, as we saw, since you're always going from the observed to the unobserved, you can always be wrong. So, you know, Hume basically lays out, well, if you go from the past, which you observe in the past, that say, every time you put popcorn in the microwave, and, you know, it, you get, you know, it gets popped, that that may not happen the next time. And we have no way to prove that it will. We have no way to prove that it won't, but no way to prove that it will. Because we never see the causation, or so he claims. And so because of that, he ends up being skeptical. Because he can't prove that God did not cause the universe, but he can't disprove, he can't prove that God didn't. So because of his sort of, you know, sloppy you know, causation, it could be true, it could be false. So he's not an atheist, but an agnostic. Now, he did have an interesting essay in analysis on miracles. Because back when Hume was human, miracles were kind of a big deal. In fact, um, you know, today, of course, you know, we have towns and so forth have different ways to attract people to make money. They'll, they'll have like, you know, festivals. You know, like, like Soft Chop, we have the Worm Print Festival. Or they'll have, like we have here recently, the Artist and Bloom Festival. And the idea is to you know, attract people so you get their, you know, also we get their money. And, you know, back in the medieval days, people, of course, wanted to do the same thing. Get you know, people come in. But in the medieval days, your options for, like, cool stuff, pretty limited. You know, no roller coasters, no, you know, nothing really super fancy. But the big draw to a lot of villages would be a miracle. You would have, for example, a statue crying blood. Or you would hear tales about a person who could heal the sick or the lame with but a touch. Or you know, a sighting of the image of the Savior or the Madonna, the Madonna in, you know, in a tree. Not, not like, you know, not like, you know, Jesus in a tree, but, you know, like a grilled cheese sandwich type of deal. And so, you know, places would make money from this. And Hume, you know, investigated the question of miracles. And this is what he put forth. Because, again, in Hume's day, there were still, you know, villages and towns that would claim they had a miracle. And people would go to, go to see it, and they'd bring money, they'd stay in the town, and so it would bring a lot of revenue. And Hume said, well, how should we judge miracles? Well, he says, even though he's got the view that causation is kind of loose, he says, we should go with what we know, which is more likely. And he says, what is more likely to occur? That people are lying or that a miracle is occurring? And he says, we know people lie, especially when people are, you know, it involves, you know, money. So the more probable explanation he says is, is the statue, you know, really crying blood? Or are people lying so people will come and spend money? And he says the more probable explanation is lying. Now, again, given his view, he can't say the miracles are impossible. But essentially, he takes a practical approach, which is more likely. People are lying, or is a miracle happening? And his view is it's more likely people are lying. Interestingly, there are still you know, miracles claimed today. Usually, they're, they're often kind of like, um, compared to the middle, medieval miracles, they're not so awesome. You know, like, Faces on grilled cheese sandwiches, that kind of stuff. Now, he does accept, and this is why, again, he's, he's not classified as an atheist, part of the reason, is he does say that if you look around in the universe, there is an indication that whatever kind of runs the show is something like, or analogous to human intelligence. So he does find the idea that there's something making all this stuff go on somewhat appealing. Although, again, he's rather skeptical about, about this. And at best, we only have some very vague you know, remarks. 
Now, interestingly, boringly enough, there is in his work on religion what is called the mystery passage, which goes like this. He says, a person seasoned with a just sense of the imperfection of natural reason will fly to real truth with the greatest of avidity, while the haughty dogmatist, persuaded that he can erect a complete system of theology by the mere help of philosophy, disdains any further aid and rejects this adventitious instructor. Now, the critical part is this. To be a philosophical skeptic, and a man is, and a man of letters, the first and most essential step towards becoming a sound, believing Christian. Now, the reason why this is a mystery passage is because there are two equally sort of, well, kind of plausible interpretations. One is the skeptical, namely this. No, though he was not a theist, the skepticism creates room for faith. How so? Well, if our reason is not, you know, completely reliable, then any proofs that try to show that God doesn't exist will be unreliable. So there's room for the, the doubt, sort of, you know, interestingly and boringly enough, the doubt about reason leaves room for faith. Because you can never be sure that God doesn't exist, so he could exist, and that leaves a passage for, you know, basically an opening for faith. The other interpretation is this, that the only way you can be a Christian is by being a skeptic, because all the arguments pretty clearly show that God probably doesn't exist. And Hume, you know, clearly a skeptic about religion, but it does kind of leave like an open, whether he's being, the view is, you have to be a Christian, you've got to reject reason, or that given the weakness of reason, then it's perfectly reasonable to have and then, of course, he died. He's still dead today. Before heading to the very end of Hume, looking at his impact, etc., anything about Hume religion that needs more Hume stuff. Now, as we saw, pretty much all his stuff, you know, causation, skepticism regarding the senses, personal identity, it ends up in, you know, skepticism. That he says basically, all the questions he looked at, he ends up basically being, you know, confused about it. You know, we saw in his skepticism regarding the senses, he began with the assumption he could prove that we should have faith in our senses. Ends up being a skeptic. Personal identity is trying to work it out. And he says, us, oh, you know, screw it. It's all just a matter of grammar. With religion, it starts off. It's like, oh, you can't know either way. You can't be an atheist. You can't be be a theist, you just can't, you can't remember. And so he concludes that reason can't prove even the most basic or fundamental beliefs. So he claims that essentially, you know, ends up in a skeptical position. Now, he's somewhere in many ways to our good dead friend John Locke. As you recall in the ancient days when we were talking about Locke, Locke's approach to skepticism is kind of practical. He doesn't say we can have certainty, but crudely put, he says, we can get good enough. Does the fire really exist? Can't be sure. And if you stand in the fire, does it hurt a whole bunch? Yeah, it does. So we know enough not to hopefully stand in the fires. And Hume takes a similar sort of view, namely that what he calls natural instinct will keep us from falling to skepticism. You know, like he says in you know, many of his, his writings, he says, well, you can be a skeptic while you're really thinking about it in, you know, philosophy class. But once you get out in the world, you know, like lunchtime, the skepticism goes. You don't doubt if your sandwich exists. You don't doubt if the bus exists. So his view, in a way, is that life is an antidote to skepticism. We just can't. We just can't maintain it. So he ends up with a form of mitigated skepticism in the sense that Philosophically, of course, we can have all these doubts, he claims. But when you get out in real life, we don't apply that, you know, in a practical sense. 
Now, he thinks this is actually kind of a good thing. Why? Well, his view is, is that if we're skeptical about our capacity to be sure, his view is we'd be less dogmatic and less fanatic. So if you, if you have the view, well, I can't know about this for sure, his claim is that people would be, you know, in the case of academics, better behaved, or maybe life in general. Because if we're not absolutely sure we're right, we'd probably be less inclined to do horrible stuff. I mean, to use a you know, very concrete example, if someone's religious, but they're not completely sure they're absolutely right about it, they'd be less inclined to kill people who disagree with them. Because they might think, well, I could be wrong, and it'd be a hell of a thing if we're not killing people or this disagreement when I'm the one that's actually wrong. And he regards that kind of certainty as potentially kind of dangerous. So maybe it's good not to have certainty. So tracing back to our um, you know, previous dead guys, Descartes, as you recall, was looking for absolute certainty and believed that he had achieved it. His critics, of course, believed that he did not. John Locke wanted certainty, but he set more modest goals. You know, his, his view was we want the light of the sun, but we got to settle for what we got, which is basically a candle. And he, so Locke ends up taking a fairly practical approach. You know, the, you don't know the fire exists, but at least you know not to stand in it. Now Hume started off kind of like Descartes. He wanted to get certainty. In fact, all these guys wanted certainty. But he ends up, in the end, like Descartes, saying nothing is certain. And then, of course, he died, and is still dead today. We can't be certain about that, but that's what we think. Before transitioning from a good dead friend, Dave Hume, to a good dead friend, Emmanuel Kant, or I.K., as his close friends called him, anything about uh, David Hume that needs more stuff. In fact, I think he was known as the notorious IK. Wow. Total luck. But it would be an interesting story. <laughs> Maybe more of the philosophical IK. I guess that would be it. A little background for Emmanuel. He was born in Konigsberg, East Prussia, on April 22nd. Yeah, his birthday's coming up, in 1724. He was born into a Pietist family. And Pietism is Protestant, you know, a form of Protestantism. And it's a very involves a very severe puritanical lifestyle. And the emphasis was, and this will be kind of ironic when we look at Kant, on faith and religious feelings as opposed to reason and theological doctrines. Or maybe not surprising, because he essentially revolts against feelings and, um, and faith in favor of reason in a lot of doctrines. He went to the University of Konigsberg as a student, later became a professor. He was about five feet tall, uh, frail and thin. He was one of those people who knew a lot about you know, geography and the world, but apparently never traveled more than 60 miles from his home. He had brothers and sisters who he helped out financially, so apparently they weren't as successful as him, but it wasn't particularly close to them. He was probably best known in his town for being extremely orderly, that he would always walk at the same time every day. And the place where he walked was known as the Philosopher's Walk. And you can actually go there and walk the walk. Uh, and now that you look at Khan, you can talk the talk as well. They still have a Khan festival uh, that goes on. I think it's still going. We're not, not like right now, but they have a festival for him. Which is, I'm sure it's pretty exciting. Probably like a lot of beer and sausages. Now, this is one of the anecdotes about him was one day when he was supposed to be walking, he didn't show up. And he was so precise, the locals supposedly could step their clocks by him. And so they ran to his house. They're like, what happened? What happened? And he said, apparently, he was reading a book and got so interested that he forgot to take his, his walk. But promised never to do that again, because otherwise people would be, would be worried. So what was he up to? What was he doing? Well, he contributed a lot of stuff. He wrote in metaphysics, logic, aesthetics, theology, also math, physics, geography, anthropology. And the people who wrote their dissertations on Kant claimed that he revolutionized philosophy. 
and some who devote their life to Kant claim you can divide philosophy into two epics. Before Kant, BK, and, no, not Burger King, and after Kant, um, which is what they claim. You know, not being devoted to Kant, um, you know, clearly there was like a time before him and a time after him, but I don't really divide philosophy up that way. But there's some people who, who do. So what was he up to? Well, one of his main influences was, not surprisingly, given his like Prussian background, was our good dead friend, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz. And he was probably influenced by a fellow named Christian Wolff, no relation to Wolf Blitzer. Or maybe there is. He was born in 1679, died in 1764. I mean, Christian Wolff, not Wolf Blitzer. Surprisingly, that Wolf Blitzer is still, still going. Well, Christian Wolff was supposedly a pretty average thinker, but was kind of the chief, you know, spokesperson of Leibniz. And he wrote a book called Reasonable Thoughts on God, the World, the Soul of Man, and All Things in General. And so initially Kant was kind of just, you know, hanging out with Leibnizianism, influenced by the rationalists. Then what happened is, this is how Hume kind of segues to Kant, is he read Hume's work. And he claims that reading Hume awoke him from his dogmatic slumber. And one of my professors said that way you can be dogmatic while he was awake, which is, you know, typical of philosophy jokes, which is why you don't get, a, you get some, but not a lot of philosophers going into comedy. And it's why I never, I won't quit my day job. You won't see me on Comedy Central. <laughs> or you might. Who knows? I'm still disappointed I didn't get the Daily Show. Danny John's do it. It was to be mine. Now, his goal basically is, as we'll see, pretty much the same as the other dead guys. They're all kind of trying to do the same thing. Now he assumes this. First, we do have knowledge. So in a way, he's not really playing the skeptical game. He's you know, not getting into that, that particular mess. Which is probably a smart move, because once you start getting into playing with skepticism, it ends badly. It's like wrestling a mud monster. No matter how it goes, you're covered in, you're covered in mud. Secondly, and this turns out, you know, at least partially mistaken, he assumed the fundamental principles of mathematics and Newton's physics are universal and necessary, and nothing would undermine them. Now, it turns out with Newtonian physics, not so much, because then we later got, because he assumed it would, it would be the final physics. You know, Newton had all the, had the answers. And then though there'd be refinements, it would just continue along with Newtonian physics. But then, of course, along, along comes, you know, Albert Einstein and others, and physics has changed. Now, this doesn't, you know, sort of like, doesn't like destroy or discredit Kant, but those are two critical assumptions that he makes, that, you know, math and the physics of his time get it right, and there would be nothing that would sort of over, overthrow those. But then, as we'll see, we look at his arguments and stuff, you know, his view on, for example, like ethics doesn't get overthrown by that. And his view on metaphysics really doesn't get thrown out by that. So what did he try to do? Well, like the other dead guys we looked at, goal number one was clarifying the foundation of sciences. Like all the other dead guys, he said, essentially, you know, we had the science and philosophy stuff going along, and it's all, you know, we've done a lot of good stuff, but it's all pretty messy. So we need to go in there and straighten that stuff up. So essentially the same goal as everybody else we've looked at. Now, one thing he adds that's kind of a new twist is this. First, he agrees with people like Descartes, the rationalist, that knowledge has got to be universal, it's got to be necessary, and that is to say it's got to be not just true, but you know, it's got to be true and certain. But he disagreed with the rationalist about perception and saw it as essential to science. Now, we saw with our good dead friend David Hume the idea that relations of ideas give us truths, the necessity and certainty, but Hume's view was it doesn't tell us about the world. And 
he agrees with Hume on that point, but as we'll see with a major twist. He also agreed with the empiricist that knowledge begins with experience. So he agrees with a lot of their, their stuff. But the reason why it became, well, one reason why it became famous is because he, he does, to be fair, he does really change things, things around. Now, he does agree with Hume, because Hume said, you know, you get those two types of, you know, truth. Relations of ideas, which are true and necessary, but tell you nothing about the world. Then you have matters of fact that are about the world, but cannot give you universal, necessary, or certain knowledge. So that was kind of Hume's problem. You know, you've got stuff that's certain and necessary, but tells you nothing about the world. So you can know like triangles of three sides and be certain about it, but nothing about the world is certain. And also agree, you know, also the view that the matters of fact, you know, the, empir the empirical stuff tells you about the world, but it is uncertain. So what in a way Kant's trying to do is he wants to solve that problem. How can we know about what's out there with certainty? So, you know, same problem we're looking at. All along. Now, Hume, of course, ends up taking the view since he got, you know, matters of fact, relations of ideas, here's the certainty, but you know nothing about what exists, here's uncertainty, you know what, about what exists, well, you don't know about what exists, you know, it's about what exists, supposedly. And so there's a huge gap. So you, the problem he ran into is you can't get any certainty. And Kant thinks he can solve that problem. He thinks he can get certainty, working with science, or so he claims. So task number one, clarify the foundations of science. Goal two, this is also one we saw with our good dead friends, you know, Descartes and Leibniz. It's to <clears throat> resolve the conflict between science and religion, morality, and freedom. In other words, He's trying to reconcile what science tells us about the world, which seems to con you know, go be con contrary to religion, and he also want to reconcile the science and there being morality and freedom. Because as we'll see when he get you know, um, further into Kant's theories, that science tells us one thing about the world that seems to make Religion, morality, and freedom, impossible. But Kant thinks, you know, we really want or got to have this stuff, so he's trying to make that work. I think it's, it's the same problem Descartes went into. How do you take, you know, the sciencey stuff, you know, the material science, and reconcile that with faith, freedom, morality? So, same old problem. So his two main goals are what we've seen all along. Perfect science, reconciling science with all the other stuff. But he brings in a third goal. One thing that Hume um, said, we didn't include this quote, but one thing that Hume said is, he said, you know, take any book. Is it about metaphysics? If it is, consign it to the flames. Which, of ironically, would apply to his own books as well. Now, Kant believed there was a crisis in metaphysics. What was this? Well, here's the problem. Traditional metaphysics and theology, you know, going back to you know, the old school stuff, was based on the assumption that reason could tell us about the transcendent, the metaphysical, the theological reality. That reason could tell us about the world beyond the senses. But, Kant noted, if we look at metaphysics and theology, there's been no comparable progress to what we see in the sciences. The sciences have made all these advances. You know, he's, he's writing the time period he's writing. You know, science was you know, not as impressive as today, where we've got like nukes and airplanes and you know, the Google, but still made a lot of progress, explaining a lot of stuff. So one problem is we didn't you know, seem to be making a lot of progress. In the case of metaphysics, in his nice little metaphor, he, he said, it's like we're on a dark ocean 
and there's no lighthouse, and there's not even any shores. So basically, <laughs> we're at sea with no light, and it's not even land. We're just like a drift, you know, an, an empty, you know, nothingness, which is a nice, you know, kind of horrifying metaphor. Now, one way people will try to pretend like there were lighthouses and shores was by what he calls the dogmatism of rationalism. You know, just pure reason can tell you stuff's out there. You know, you can't see, you can't see anything to go with the metaphor, because you but you just say by pure reason I know there's land. I know there's lighthouses. And Khan doesn't want to play that game. But he's still gonna find some way to save metaphysics. Why? Well, his reasoning is this. Even though metaphysics set a lot of problems, the fact that there is bad metaphysics gives you no more reason to toss the whole thing out than the fact that the, there's some you know, air that's tainted, you know, like full of smoke or you know, dust, gives you a reason to stop breathing. You know, or another word is the you know, crap analogy you didn't use, you know, the classic baby with the bathwater thing. Just because you know, the water, you know, one part is like bad, you don't want to throw out everything. Now, of course, critics would say the whole thing is bad. You know, you do, it's all bad. Get rid of all that stuff. But Colin believed there's something to, to save. Now, what he thinks we need to do, at least according to the Kant, is make that happen. So objective three, make that happen. Save metaphysics. Now, Kant also believed, this will you know, appear probably later, that the world is run by laws. There are both physical laws, what we consider, you know, what he would consider the laws of Newtonian science, but as we'll see again in his view on ethics, there are also moral laws. So to recap, he's got three objectives. Objective one, firm foundation for science. You know, just like Descartes. Objective two, reconcile science with religion, morality, and freedom. Similar to Descartes. Goal three, save metaphysics. So, before going to see how he attempts to achieve his three goals, anything about the Kant stuff so far that needs more stuff. So firstly, Kant's philosophy of knowledge. Now, he regards his predecessors as falling into dogmatism, which meant they had automatic dogs. No, <laughs> that's not true. He, uh, dogmatism is basically, well, roughly put, you know, kind of informally put, people would just believe stuff without really having a, a foundation. So if someone says someone's a dogmatist, it, what they mean kind of informally is the person just believes this, but they don't really have a good reason. They just believe just because. So he thinks that the empiricist and rationalist we're just caught up in their dogmatism. They just believe it just because they don't have any really good reasons. <laughs> so he wants to break out of the dogmatism. Now, his main work in theory of knowledge or epistemology is the infamous critique of pure reason. And it comes from the, the Greek uh, roots for the word uh, critique, which is to sort or to sift. Now, what makes Kant kind of you know, famous-like is what some describe as his own Copernican revolution. If you recall back in the ancient days of January, a thousand years ago, you know, the old you know, view, the geocentric view, was that everything in you know, the sun, everything revolves around the earth. We're the center of everything. Which of the universe is infinite is true, because every point is a center, you know, because it's all equidistant from that point. But then, of course, we end up with Copernicus' view that the Earth and everything, well, the Earth and the rest of the planets in the solar system revolve around the sun. And that was a revolution. We went from being the center to being not. Now, Kant <coughs> wants to do a similar sort of revolution. But not with you know the sun and planets, but with something else. And here's his revolution. 
Now, the old view, the view he's revolting against is this. Past empiricists would try to, you would have this, you know, here's the you know, person, and we'll say this is the, you know, contents of the person's mind, you know, give them some senses. It's kind of horribly te oh, I almost got arms. That's kind of bad. Poor guy. And the claim was is that we would have, you know, basically, you know, John Locke's view, and also Descartes' view, representational realism. You would have ideas of stuff that's out there. And empiricists would assume that knowledge corresponds to the objects. You know, representational realism. The idea you have of, say, the water bottle corresponds to the water bottle. Now, as we saw when we looked at, you know, your Descartes and other skeptics, is that any attempt to know about stuff outside by a priori means seem to not succeed. I mean, taking the, the classic skeptical argument, you have no way of knowing that what's out there matches what you're experiencing. You know, the, the problem we've seen all, all along. And so Kant is trying to address that problem. How, how do we know this? You know, Hume said you can't. And I mean, all the other other skeptics said the same, same thing. In fact, Hume went so far as to say it's vain to even address the question of are there objects out there. The only thing we can address is psychological question. Why do we have that, that delusion? Now, what's his revolution? Well, his revolution is this. If our ideas, our intuitions, must correspond to the object, we have no way of knowing of what's out here, in here, sorry, matches what's out there. Because yeah, the reason we saw it here. What Hume does is this. He reverses this. He claims it's not that our knowledge corresponds to its, the objects, but the reversal is, is that the objects correspond to our knowledge. What does he mean? Well, this. For our sensory you know, data to be experienced as objects, our mind has to impose a structural ordering upon them. And so then we can have knowledge by pure reason. How so? Well, if our knowledge has to conform to the object, we can't know anything about it a priori. But he claims, if the objects of sense must correspond to our fact of intuition, then a priori knowledge is possible. So what the heck's going on here? Well, again, the old view was basically, you know, going up to realism. Objects out there, you see them, you get idea. Idea corresponds to object. Problem. Since you can never get outside of your mind, you can never, as Hume argued, others have argued for you know, centuries, you can never see the connection. You can never see that this corresponds to that. So Kant's solution is to reverse it. Instead of saying this corresponds to this, the claim is, is that, well, instead of saying this corresponds to that, he reverses it. This, the object of knowledge corresponds to this. To use a crappy analogy. But what is the old kind of view was you look out into the world, and somehow you would see what's out there and get the idea here. Hume's view is, is or, sorry, Kant's view is, we have these concepts and stuff in our, our mind, and they are sort of put on the objects, you know, processing them as it were. So what we, the object of our knowledge is, very crudely put, kind of an amalgam of, you know, our concepts with whatever it is that we're experiencing. Or put another way, we're basically processing the, the data. So the object of knowledge is the processing of the sensory data we, we have. And as we'll see, things we can get a priori knowledge that way. And kind of the you know, my crappy you know, metaphor is, it's kind of like think of the projector as our, you know, our mind, and it's projecting this onto what is supposedly out there. 
And of course, Hume, or, sorry, Kant runs into problems with what's out there. So as you would, again, the old thing was senses correspond, you know, see object, get idea, idea corresponds to object. Kant kind of reverses that. We have this stuff in our senses, and the objects of our thought must correspond to our knowledge. So as long as you know what our concepts are, you can have a prior knowledge about what is real. So in a way, you, you might say, if you're critical, you might say he's kind of cheating. Or if you think he's, you know, successful, you would say, he's, wow, this is an amazing innovation. Now, a very good question, of course, at this point would be, what then is reality? This is what he claims. If you recall our good dead friend Barclay, Barclay's view, you know, was the to be is to be perceived. So the water bottle is an idea in the mind. Now, Kant's view is not that the mind creates reality. So it's not, he's not a phenomenologist. He doesn't believe it's all just in our, our minds. But he claims the way reality appears depends on both the senses and the mind. What the mind does, and again, go with my crappy analogy of the projector, it imposes its structure on experience. Or to use another crappy analogy, think of like, um, you know, file, you know, organizing file folders. That's an organizational structure, and you impose that on the paper, organizing it in that way. And so when you get when you have the you know sensory data, our mind is already organizing its stuff, filing it so to speak, categorizing it, etc. Now, you, you might say, well, but I don't notice myself doing this. You know, I look at something, I don't, I'm not aware of myself doing all this this stuff. And Kant says, yeah, what happens is as soon as we become aware of it, we've already done that. We've already put on the structure on it. We've already done all this stuff. It's part of, you know, the perception process. So we can never, going back to Hume's problem, we can never know the reality as it is prior to our experience of it. So, you know, if we ask the question, can you know for real, for real, what's out there? Kyle would have to say, well, no. We, we, we can't experience the world we don't experience. It's like Hume's problem. Can you sense what you're not sensing? No. Can you experience what you're not experiencing? No. But he thinks if human minds have the same structure, then within human experience, it's possible to have objective and universal knowledge. Or so he claims. So again, kind of this twist around is instead of, you know, you know, we see the object, get the idea. His view is, is that data comes in and we process it. And then what the object of our, our knowledge is not what's out there, it's what's in here. But it's a combination of sense data plus our processing. And we can know, according, as we'll see in a bit, we can know a priority according to Kant, those concepts and stuff. So we can have a priori knowledge about what is. Or so we can. Either brilliant or a cheat, or both. Why can't it be both? Okay, before pressing on anything about the, the Kantian revolution that needs any more stuff. Now, the challenge again he faces is basically this How can we know about what exists with that certainty that he, he craves? Because again, his goal is to get to the certainty. And he saw, you know, pure empiricism fail, pure rationalism fail, and he's trying to get his solution going. Now, to see how this is possible, we have to look at some critical concepts for Burkant, which are basically varieties of judgment, where you judge stuff. Now, the first type of judgment is this, what are called analytic judgments. These are, going back to our good dead friend Leibniz, this is what Leibniz would call, you know, truth of reason. They're judgments based on the principle of contradiction. So a true analytical, analytical judgment 
is such that its contradiction must be false. I mean, to use a kind of crappy example, uh, take the um, judgment of you know triangle. I will use the example of triangles having three sides. Now, the claim that triangles don't have three sides is its contradiction. So, if we say you know triangles have three sides and triangles don't have three sides, create a contradiction. And so we know by analysis of triangle that it, it's got to have three sides. Now, one thing that that Kant claims, we saw this when we were talking about our good dear friend Leibniz, he claims that the predicate in such a judgment is contained in the subject. And the truth of this is independent of the facts and does not yield any knowledge about the world. So, I mean, going back to the usual crappy, crappy example, If we have the subject, you know, take that big triangle, the predicate would be, you know, three-sided. And it's claimed that somehow the you know, predicate is contained within the subject. Now, as I mentioned before, I talked about this concept. We know what it is, for example, for like uh, my Gatorade to be contained within the bottle. Yeah, it makes sense. It's in the bottle. It's not loose, roaming around with any terrible. Gatorade crumbs. But what is it for the predicate to be contained within the subject? It's a metaphor, but the answer is really don't, don't know. I mean, people who are critical of you know, that kind of, kind of notion say, what does that mean? What does it even mean? I know what it is for my Gatorade to be in the bottle, or you know, a burger in my tummy, but I don't know what it is for a subject to contain a predicate. But at least the analytic judgments, we can say, do make some kind of sense. These would be essentially what we call a priori judgments. What, you know, lives are called truths of reason. And they're essentially, they don't tell us about the world, but they essentially are judgments that must be true. You know, triangles have three sides, squares have four sides, bachelors are married, that type of stuff. So that is the analytic. Now, interestingly, broadly enough, contemporary philosophy splits into two main camps what is called analytic philosophy, which is the stuff I do, this is what's called continental philosophy. Not like a continental breakfast, but it's the stuff that I don't do. And I once had tried to have someone explain it to me, but I, they talked about storms and bottles and reality confronting itself as itself. So I don't know what they do. I know what I do, but I'm not really quite sure what they do. But they probably say the same thing about me. Like, what the hell is he, is he doing? But anyway, so analytic philosophy kind of comes from that. Now the second type of judgment are what Kant calls synthetic judgments. Not in the sense that they're made out of like, you know, synthetic material like you know, plastics or Gatorade, but in the sense that they synthesize. How so? Well, these judgments do tell us about the world. And what he claims is they synthesize the subject with the predicate. And again, a fair question is, what does that mean? What could that even mean? Now, unlike analytic judgments, denying a synthetic judgment doesn't result in a contradiction. I mean, to use my usual example. If I deny that triangles have three sides, I'm saying essentially the three-sided figure doesn't have three sides. Oops, contradiction, false. So it must be true to the three sides. With a synthetic judgment, though, you can deny them without there being a contradiction. So if I say, for example, the bottle is on the table, or if I say the bottle is not on the table, there's nothing about bottle that makes it a contradiction to say that it's not on the table. Because something can be a bottle if it's on the table, and it can be a bottle off the table. So that the judgment, a synthetic you know, judgment would be the bottle is on the table. It's so far, nothing to it. You know, truths of reason, truths of fact. Well, Kant wants to do again is find a way we can know about stuff out there a priori without falling into all that, you know, dogmatism. Before going to the remaining stuff, anything about analytic versus synthetic that needs more stuff. Now, we also get our two old friends, 
a priori knowledge and a posteriori knowledge. As you recall from the ancient days and long ago, a priori knowledge is knowledge you've got without experience. You just know by pure reason. Analytic judgments are all a priori. You know they're true, roughly put, without wanting. Yeah, you know, using my usual stupid example, if I draw a triangle, put my hand on it and say, how many sides does it have? And you'll say, three. Yeah, three. Well, how's that possible? But of course, you just know by, you know, by pure reason, triangles have three sides. Don't do it. A posteriori knowledge, though, is knowledge that is after experience. So you can know the triangles have three sides, pure reason. Knowing like how big the triangle is I've drawn, you get a look. Or knowing if there's a triangle in Alaska, you have to look. I mean, there probably is some. But to know for sure, you have to go and look in Alaska. Now, Kant then, to get to those LT wants, starts trying to jam together, or mash up, to use you know, the term, these things. So what does he get? The first combination he considers is this, the analytic a priori. And these are based entirely on the principle of non-contradiction. And these are things that are certainly true, and you know them by pure reason. But they don't tell you anything about the world. And now I'll use the usual example. If um, somebody's in a bar looking to pick someone up, but they don't want to hook up with a married, a married man, they know that if a person is a bachelor, they're unmarried, a priori unmarried. But of course, they don't know if any particular person is a bachelor or not. They know if they are a bachelor or unmarried by definition, that would be a analytic a priori truth. It tells them nothing about the world. It just tells them something that is definitely true, but not anything about the world. I mean, to use, again, to use my crappy crap example, you know a person is not married and they're male, they're a bachelor. But you don't know if that per person is a bachelor by knowing the definition of bachelor. Likewise, you know a person's got a triangle in their backpack, you know it's got three sides. But you don't know if they're, they get a triangle. The next jam up is the analytic a posteriori. And there are none of these, because this would be a, essentially an a priori, a posteriori judgment, which would be impossible. So none of that stuff. The third, or the second, since this one is, you know, is out, is the synthetic a posteriori. What's that? Well, these are judgments based in experience. They're a posteriori, so they're, you know, after experience. They're synthetic, so they involve, you know, the subject predicate, you know, being synthesized. And they do tell us about the world. Examples would be, uh, well, you know, the bottle's on the table. It tells us about the world, and it's based in experience, you know. So where most of the stuff we deal with would be this. So, so far, nothing particularly exciting just some new terminology. Now what Kant needs though is the third, let me drop this, or fourth category. The magic category is the, one of those card things, let me drive around. They're much faster. So the final category is the synthetic a priori. This is the magic category. In the sense that this is what he needs. What is this? Well, these are judgments that are a priori, known through pure reason, but, here's the magic part, they give us knowledge about the world. What would be an example? Well, one would be this. All events have a cause. Now, that's something that we cannot, as Hume argued, through experience, we, we can never prove that. How so? Well, in order to prove that with experience, 
you would have to check every single event and determine that it has a cause. But as a practical matter, could you do that? No, because I mean, maybe all the stuff that existed before you existed, maybe that stuff was uncaused. There's all the stuff you can't observe, and there's all the stuff that's going to be occurring after you're, you're gone. Uh, and if we did it like a project, you know, well, I mean, it'd be a very practical thing. We, we, presumably no one started the project you know, back, you know, or whenever, whenever things got going, and so we'll never, we'll never know. Experience can never tell us. And you can use, like, less extreme examples. So you have something like uh, if someone claims that all squirrels are mammals, We'd have to go, you know, well, actually, that'd be a crappy example because I mean, so they get more, but I mean, it'd be an example of something that we couldn't confirm empirically because we, we'd have to get every squirrel and, and check it. I guess in that case, we probably could. So, crappy example. Damn you, squirrels. You're giving me a crappy example again. That'll teach me to work. You know, it's like they say never work with children, animals, or water when doing films. I value the rule I brought in the squirrel. They wreck, they wreck my example. Um, so, synthetic a priori. If you take some like all events of a cause, experience can never make that happen. So, then the question is, how do we know that? If we can never learn it, you know, through empirical observation, because we can't observe all all events. Now, what Kant claims is this: we bring this information to our experience of the world, and we don't get it from experience. It is a priori. But it tells us something about the world. So what Kant needs is that. Something that tells us about the world, but is known a priori and is also certain. And so he's going to find stuff that does that. The first example he claims, this may seem kind of weird, is mathematics. Now, normally we would think that math would be, you know, analytic a priori. You know, just, you know, it's a priori knowledge. We generally think of it as just, you know, analysis of stuff. But he claims that math is here. How so? Well, take the following. Do we know that 7 plus 5 is equal to 12 is true? Yes. Do we know that through our senses? Well, I mean, we see the symbols on the board, but we but we, we don't have to go, we don't have to go and you know you don't have to travel around looking at every seven plus five, seeing that it's twelve. We know supposedly by pure reason. So why isn't it just you know analytic a priori? This is what he claims. He claims you cannot analyze the concepts of five, seven, and plus, and find they explicitly contain the concept of twelve. Unlike, you know, supposedly triangle explicitly containing the concept of three sides. Now, of course, one obvious problem with this is, is it rests really heavy on this notion of, like, analysis. What does that, that mean? And again, people who are critical of that say exactly that problem. What does it mean for the subject contain the predicate? I know what it is for, you know, stuffed crust pizza to contain cheese, but what is it for my subject to contain my predicate? What can that even but if you buy that notion, then I guess it kind of works. <laughs>